Good morning. part two in a series that I'm doing um, called The Precipice of the Trans Monday, and um, the first one I gave was in July, I think. Um, it can be found on the St. Cloud Church of Christ YouTube channel. Unfortunately, there were problems with the live streaming that day, so the video is a little bit choppy, but uh, you should be able to at least get the gist of it. Um, so the series is about uh, the limits of our cognitive ability to know and understand God. Um, it's also about the necessity of developing our spiritual faculties in order to gain a deeper understanding and knowing of God. And when I talk about spiritual faculties, I'm sort of basing it on a classical and medieval model of um, human nature, which is called tripartite faculty psychology. There are different variants of it, and this is probably going to, this is going to be a sort of um, insufficient summary of it. But um, I gave a sermon on this too. This was my first sermon, um, although I would probably disagree with some of the things I said. <laughs> I said in that sermon because uh, I keep continuing to learn and I know, don't know everything. Um, so first, there's the passions. Um, the passions are the, the bestial part of man, consisting of the emotions, the instinct, the needs, need for survival, etc. Um, this is something that God endowed um, in, on um, every creature. And then there's the intellect or the reason, um, which uh, on one hand keeps the passions in check and guides them and uh, reasons to an abstract moral law. It also has the ability to search deeper than mere physicality, and even deeper than the abstract, and locate and commune, commune with that underlying spiritual being that supports and sustains it all. The intellect or the reason or the spirit of the soul is the image bearer of God. And that's um, at least my model of it. I think it's accurate. Um, and I'm being a little bit careful with my words because, like I said, I don't completely understand, understand the, the human nature or, or creation or anything. So I'm being a little bit careful to say something that I don't quite, that I couldn't really make a case for. Um, there's also the will, and this acts upon the influence and the passions of the, uh, of the passions and the intellect. So there's the, the passions, the intellect, and the will. There's the, the tripartite aspect of it. And some have thought that the will is actually a sub-faculty of the intellect, um, which I think is plausible, if not probable. So that would be where I sort of disagree with my last sermon. Um, not my last sermon, but what I gave on this. So the purpose of this series is to find a way to use our higher abilities of the reason and intellect or our spirit to connect with God, who is being itself. And in the last sermon, we demonstrated the limits of, cogn of cognition in our knowing of God. So we are incapable of using our rationality to, to completely know God. We can name some aspects of him. He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's omnibenevolent. But we will never gain a full or complete understanding or knowing of God just by using our rationality. But then we explored the importance of knowing God. So um, there seems to be a contradiction here. How are we supposed to know God? Or how, how can we be commanded to know God if it's impossible for us to know God? 
Um, but we recognize that this apparent dilemma is really only apparent. And it's due to an equivocation in the term no. So we're using two definitions of the word no. We're using no in a cognitive sense, meaning we know the features, such as omniscience, omnipresence. But then there's no in the intimate sense of the word. And this is um, uh, sort of uh, you know, one of the Greek definitions of the word that's usually translated, that can be translated to no, is um, something that's a little bit less easy to explain, but it's easier to use it um, to uh, portray it using an analogy. So I asked Elizabeth's permit, well, I sort of told her what I was going to do. <laughs> um, but uh, um, there's the difference between knowing my wife and knowing my wife. So if I know her, I know she's five foot seven. I know that she's blonde. She has blue eyes. I know that she's pretty. <laughs> um, but if I know my wife, well, that's a little bit more difficult to explain. I know how I feel around her. I know how she makes me feel, and I know how she feels in certain circumstances. I don't know, it's, just, it's hard to explain. It's something where you're around that person and you just know them. Although, on some level, they're still a mystery to you. Um, you never completely know your wife. She's always sort of a phantom. Uh, a beautiful phantom. Floating there. Um, but I think, you, I think you understand my point. It's the difference between knowing somebody, somebody's characteristics and having a deep, intimate relationship with that person. Um, so the sermons I'll be giving for an unforeseeable amount of time will be on how we can use our spiritual faculty to know God in this way. Beyond the mere knowledge of his characteristics, which we ultimately can't, ultimately can't fully grasp anyway. So some of the spiritual ways um, that we'll explore. Um, in this sermon, we're going to be talking about the reading of mystic scripture. Um, the, uh, and these ones are these following ones aren't really in order. I haven't really decided what order I want to go in yet. But, um, the hope that we derive from scripture, contemplations on the being of God, contemplations on the law of God, the experience of God through creation, God's spirits working within us, Christ living within us, the love of God that channels through his followers, and um, any more I can think of. So hopefully it'll uh, have me set for a while. My 2020 will be on the precipice of the transmundane part 85. <laughs> um, we also briefly discussed the meaning of this word mystery, and I hope to shed some more light on that in this sermon. Although, not as much as I wanted to, because uh, it had to be shorter than I wanted it to. Um, but next time we'll just be like a part two to this part two. Um, so the word, uh, the Greek word that's translated to mystery is basically the same in Greek. It's mis mysterium, um, which is derived from the word mueo, uh, which originally meant to shut the mouth and eventually came to mean to initiate into the mysteries. Um, the implication is that one shuts his mouth in response to having become initiated into a religious rite. <coughs> Mystery, therefore, is that which is known to the one who has been initiated. The revelation is the initiation into the mysteries. In a Christian sense, it's a revelation that can only come from God and is beyond discovery through cognitive reasoning. So it does not mean mystery in the typical English sense of the word. It doesn't mean like something that a forensic scientist has to go out and put the dots together and come up with a model of what happened on a kind of crime scene. It's, um, it's more along the lines of the first steps in the process of a mystical discovery. And uh, like I said, the word uh, derives from whale, which is to initiate. And so what, what does initiate mean? Well, the revelation is not, is in its entirely, it's in its entirety is not immediately known. Entirely known. 
the end is not yet in sight. So you can think of like, um, oh, well, actually, I'll go to that later. So there are many instances of the word mystery in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, but we'll only talk about the, uh, I forgot the quotation mark there, but we'll only talk about the, uh, um, the uses in the New Testament today. Although, well, we're going to go to the Old Testament eventually. So uh, there's the mystery of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. <coughs> There is the mystery of God's will in Ephesians 1.19. There is the mystery of the faith in 1 Timothy 3.9. There is the mystery of God incarnate in 1 Timothy 3.16. There is the mystery of marriage and the union of God's body in Ephesians 5.32. There is the mystery of Christ in us, Colossians 1.27. And there are many other uses. But what good is an initiation if it doesn't go anywhere? If you initiate a race, you intend to finish the race. If you initiate a political movement, you intend to continue to progress that political movement towards an end. <coughs> if you take a trip, if you initiate a trip to Grandma's house, you plan on eventually getting to Grandma's house. Thankfully, it doesn't take as long anymore. <laughs> she lives in cloud. Uh, or it's not Um But these all have a purpose for beginning, to reach a goal. But we will never reach this goal in this life. But we're still obligated to continue to scale that precipice. Um, and that was what that whole illustration in the last sermon was about, was scaling that precipice. And eventually, the, the protagonist in that story goes blind um, because he realizes that his cognitive ability is not able to discover the rest of God. And so he begins to use his other senses, and that's the by analogy, the spiritual faculty of man. He uses his other senses like his smell and his touch and his um, hearing and his taste to continue to discover the rest of God, but the picture is never, the, the tapestry is never done. It's never complete. At least in this life. So let's go to 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he, is he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to continue to increase in these things, in our knowledge and in our um, self-control and our, self and our steadfastness and our godliness. All of these things are supposed to be ever increasing. And are they ever going to be complete? No. You got that one right. No, that wasn't the test. All right. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 4.1. First Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 4.1 This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So, we're to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Uh, so now we're going to talk about sort of the, um, the interpretive lens through which we should be reading Scripture. It's particularly in this case the Old Testament, but it would apply to the New Testament too. Um, and in my opinion, the way that we should interpreting, be interpreting the world, the facts on the ground, everything we see, um, should all be viewed through this interpretive lens. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2.
And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my knowledge, or my message were not, were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. For we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no, man, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So, we get a little bit of a uh, better idea of what, um, a further idea of what the word mystery means from this passage. It's something that has been hidden for ages and then is revealed. Um, and it's revealed specifically to those who are spiritual. Those with the mind of Christ and those who are spiritual are able to understand the things revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And we, I mean, if you talk to atheists and non-believers and agnostics and they read something in scripture, like their, their favorite one is, uh, is um, and I all think they're so smart for knowing this really obscure passage, but and no offense to anybody, I should have said that. Um, uh, in, uh, I think it's 2 Kings where Elijah is walking up to Damascus and these, or he's walking down from Damascus and these uh, 42, or not 42, probably more than 42, but this group of, of it says boys comes and starts taunting him and says, go up you baldy. Um, uh, and then Elijah curses them in the name of God and then two she-bears come out of the forest and maul 42 of them. Um, that's their favorite passage because it seems so bizarre just reading. It's like, well, what is that supposed to mean? But, first of all, they don't really have I mean, they're just re if you just read the surface of it, the English translation, it doesn't work very well. Because the word boys means like a strapping young lad type thing. So this is more of a, this is more of a gang of guys basically daring Elijah to, to, come to, to, to uh, go to where they are. Or, you know, go up with Baldi. They always focus on the Baldi part, like he's cursing them because they call him Baldi. But it's because they're talking him. Anyway. Um, if you go beyond the mere letter of the word, this passage has some pretty deep meaning to it. But we won't go into that now. I actually didn't even have that written down. Um, I'm trying to do it extemporaneously today, so I might go on some tangents. In reading scripture, we are to go beyond the mere appearance of the word and contemplate the spirit behind it. Let's go to John 7.24. <coughs> John chapter 7, verse 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And the context of this is the issue of Jesus healing people on the Sabbath. They were saying, well, you can't heal people on the Sabbath. They're being extremely legalistic about it. And Jesus is basically saying, judge by the spirit of the word, not by what, what it appears to say. 
Um, so the point is that legalistic interpretations of Scripture miss the point. The point is to understand the meaning behind it, the purpose for which it was written, the theological, but ultimately spiritual, meaning of that passage, of any given passage. So how are we to know the meaning, of behind, the meaning behind it? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze out, might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So Christ is the meaning behind all Scripture and behind all that is. Christ is the very Logos of God. That's what it means in John when it says He's the Word. The word, the word for word is logos, which is where we get our word logic, but it means something more along the lines of the ideas, the philosophy, the very words in the mind and in the, in the uh, manifestations of God. So Christ is the archetype of what was written and what was created, and Christ is, of course, God himself. So with this in mind, this interpretive lens that Christ and the Spirit are uh, the, the filter through which we should read Scripture and interpret the world. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and see what we can see what we can uh, see here by using this, the, this uh, interpretive model. Exodus 3, 1 through 6. Now Moses was keeping the, the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, and came to Horeb, the, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to this great sight, by the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. I say that's so. the proper response to seeing that. Um, so we'll talk about verses two, uh, verses 2 through 5. The mystery of the burning bush illum illuminates many aspects of Christian doctrine. So again, we're using this interpretive lens to see what this means, rather than just reading, oh yeah, God appeared to the burning bush. What does this mean for us? What is the spiritual meaning behind this? I think that the burning bush illuminates the incarnation. The incarnation meaning Christ being God incarnate. Just as the immaterial, impassable, and immutable presence of God and the appearance of a blazing fire penetrated and enveloped the physical matter of the bush, sanctifying it and, and the ground around it, so did God inhabit the body of a fleshly man and cause it to become divine. I think it illuminates the, holy, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, God's Spirit dwells within the fleshly body of his followers and purifies us. I think it, it uh, helps to explain or illuminate the sanctity of God's creation. In the same way, God permeates and upholds the cosmos. And we'll get into that in later sermons. And all of this. So how is it that God can dwell within his creation without destroying it? 
The mystery is revealed in the burning bush. Fire naturally consumes whatever is aflame with its heat. But the flame of God is holy and divine. And therefore, instead of burning, it purifies. And, of course, Moses was in awe. He said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight, but the bush is not burned. This is the same response that we should have to the mysteries of God. Things that seem, some of them seem paradoxical, but it's, that's, I mean, that's what makes it a mystery. So, uh, now let's talk a little bit more about verse 6. Um, he said, I am the Lord, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So here God tells Moses who he is. He says, I'm the God of your father, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses' response is, again, justified. I mean, God, the um, oral traditions of the Old Testament, of the first um, of Genesis, basically, of the Old Testament had been circulating within the Jewish community while they were enslaved in Egypt. And I'm sure Moses heard about it. And so when he, he's probably like, yeah, yeah, God, whatever. But then he literally sees God right there. And the God that he'd heard about, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars, and, and, uh, and you know, yeah. The God that wrestled Jacob and renamed him Israel. Um, now we'll talk about verses, or actually we'll read verses 13 through 14. Then Moses said, if I come, so this is after, um, uh, this is after uh, God told Moses to um, approach Pharaoh. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God already revealed who he was by saying that he's the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But this wasn't enough for Moses. He wanted a name. But God's answer only deepened the mystery even more. It didn't really explain to Moses at all who he was, although it did. <clears throat> so the proper translation of YHWH, Asher, YHWH, I am, whatever I am, I don't, is disputed. That's why I'm being kind of, like, I don't really know what it says. It's been translated a number of ways. I am who I am, or I will be, or I will be who or what I will be. I am who I am. I am the beginning. I am because I am. I will be what I will be. These are all different ways that this has been translated. And many Jews have traditionally held that the use of YHWH is almost a play on words. Um, and that the way it should be pronounced is the theological implications of, God, of God's response have also been debated. The response Moses received would have been less than satisfying for someone in that milieu in which each god had a specific name that describes his particular niche within the pantheon of God. So, for example, Molech means king, Baal means lord, Dagon means something like grain. Ra means sun. Isis means throne. So each name for each god of the Egyptians and the, and the uh, surrounding uh, peoples, um, each, each of their names had something that approximated what they were for. Um, so that wouldn't have been satisfying to Moses. But after four millennia, scholars and theologians still have not settled on what God said to Moses in response to the simple question of his name. What's your name? Um, oh, my name's Gabriel or something. That's not how God responded. My opinion is that God's response is meaningful on a number of levels. Its, en its enigmatic nature indicates that the being of God will never be captured within a single word, because God is beyond any word. Whatever the proper translation of the phrase is, it clearly indicates that God exists in some ultimate way. He is being. The naming of something indicates ownership of it. But God has no master and therefore has no, has no name. He simply is. 
By choosing to um, respond in such an elusive manner, God seems to be making a mockery of the very idea of a being such as God having a name. How could being itself have a name when all, name derive, when all names derive from it? At another level, God's revelation to Moses is the beginning of an initiation into the very mystery of Christ himself. And we'll demonstrate that by going to a few passages in the New Testament. We'll go to John 6.35. John 6.35 Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. The Christ is the bread of life. The Messiah that was prophesied about in the Old Testament is the bread of life. And God revealed that to Moses by saying, I am. Through him, they would never hunger. And he proved it in the desert by giving them manna and quail to eat. Jesus says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. No, okay, so we see in the Bible many instances of the use of of something like the type of what is to come, or the foreshadowing of what is to come. Adam is the type of the Christ that, is, that was to come. Elijah was the type of John the Baptist that was to come. And we see this, I mean, if you read it, if you read scripture through this lens that we discussed earlier, it becomes so much more clear. The, the manna and the quail that came down from heaven was the type of the Christ that was to come. He was the bread that came down from heaven. Let's go to John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then John 9, 5. John 9, 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We see Jesus using these I am phrases all over the place. And, and there's one that I didn't go to where um, the Jews say something like, um, basically, you knew Abraham or something like that. And, and Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. I mean, he says, I am all over the place in John. Um, so in the same way that Moses was enlightened by the flame of the bush, and in the same way that the Israelites were guided by the light of the pillar of flame, so we who follow Christ are illuminated by him and will never walk in darkness. Let's go to John 10, 7 through 10. <coughs> so, Jesus said, uh, so Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that I may have life and have it abundantly. Throughout, uh, though the entirety of the mystery was not known to Moses, of course, the mystery contained the plan of salvation, and for generations, Israel was the key to the fruition of that plan. Let's go to John 11, 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Also contained within the mystery, mystery was the promise of resurrection and its achievement through Christ. God would raise, so now this is the type, God would raise Israel from the death of Egypt and baptize them in the Red Sea, and uh, it says that in 1 Corinthians 10 too, and raise them into a mighty, a mighty nation, a foreshadowing of the ceremony of water that we undergo in order to signify our death and resurrection from sin into life. And of course, our resurrection from, from our physical deaths into 
the spiritual world, the spiritual realm. Um, John fourteen six. <coughs> Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God revealed to Moses that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, there would have been no other way for, them, for the Israelites to get out of Egypt except by the mighty works of God. That's the way. God bestowed the truth upon Moses in a dramatic way when he delivered the law to Moses. That was the truth. And were it not for the help of God, the Israelites would have remained enslaved in Egypt, which is no life at all, would have drowned in the sea, and would have perished in the wilderness. If God hadn't been with them this whole time, they would have died. Now let's go to Mark 14, 61 through 62. Mark 14, 61 through 62. But he remained silent. This is when Jesus was on trial. And made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. The Son of God is the Messiah, the Son of Man spoken of in Daniel. The Messiah is both God and man, just as the burning bush is both divine and natural. So through this wonderful response to Moses' childlike question, God revealed that God cannot be defined. God is being. God is the plan of salvation. And he also revealed the, the incarnation of Christ. This is the nature of a mystery. It is not the entirety of revelation, but merely an initiation into the full bounty of God's glory and brilliance. And actually, the entirety of Revelation, I should have said something different. Um, the, the, it is the entirety of Revelation, but we can only see a little bit of it. We can only initiate ourselves into that Revelation before we discover the full bounty and glory of God's brilliance, which we will never do in this lifetime. By reading Scripture beyond the mere letter and attaining the meaning and the spirit of it, we can more deeply explore these mysteries and know God in a far more intimate way than a mere knowledge of him can provide. If you're in need of prayer, if you desire a more spiritual faith, or if you need to know and love God more intimately, as we all do, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>